Tonight, we're very fortunate to have Richard, Bryce, and Craig make initial short presentations before we commence the Q&A session. Richard is probably well known to all of the Renew members, as he's, we've been privileged to have many uh, presentations from him over the last few years about energy efficiency in the home. He's author of Nine Steps to Energy Freedom and a major contributor to many BZE reports. He's also owned several EVs. So over to you, Richard. Hi, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we're looking at the topic of why zero carbon living is economic. And I'm looking at this through the lens of the amazing benefits of efficiency and electrification. So um, thanks again, Rob and Chris and the rest of the uh, um, Renew crew. Um, let's get into this. Um, so a quick talk from me. Uh, so about me, uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency are my professional life. Uh, I work for NHA Consulting doing commercial energy efficiency um, and I do home energy efficiency work through my freelance outfit, New Energy Thinking. As Rob mentioned, um, uh, new, The Energy Freedom Home uh, is the book that I wrote for Beyond Zero Emissions and I generally hang out at my Efficient Electric Home on Facebook. So if you're not already a member, please come along and join us. Okay, uh, just to, to set the scene, efficiency thinking. Um, I'm fond of this definition of sustainability by Paul Hawken. Uh, and he's an American environmentalist. He said sustainability is aligning with natural forces or at least not opposing them. I think that's, that sums up really well. And I, I think that um, grabs the idea of uh, jujitsu, uh, which has at its core the idea that uh, you can use your opponent's um, weight to your advantage so you can get a big uh, outcome with relatively small uh, effort. Uh, it can also be uh, seen in the idea of a, of a child's swing where the swing has got this natural frequency of, of, of swinging and if you time your pushing right then you need very little effort uh, to, to swing really high but if you want to swing faster or, or slower than that natural frequency then it takes a lot more work. So um, let's apply this idea to homes and, and first let's frame what it's not. A naive view of efficiency might be uh, that it involves substantial trade-offs. In other words, giving you savings but giving you less utility, uh, like in short showers or turning the lights off. But in reality, efficiency done well isn't like that. Efficiency done well is a win-win-win. And, and my favorite example that I've been developing over the last little while is the idea of fixing the leaky bucket. So this is an analogy where we liken a house to a leaky bucket. So heat flowing through homes is like water flowing out of a leaky bucket. So the bucket has the structure, uh, water in it, and it's got depth. So it, it, making that into a, a direct analogy, the thermal envelope of a house is like the bucket, the heat energy is like the water in the bucket, and the temperature that we want to uh, maintain is like the depth of the water in the bucket. So with that uh, in mind, it, it's hopefully you, uh, able to easily think how absurd it is to try and to keep filling faster instead of stopping the leak. Um, so with this kind of thinking, we can change the expectations around homes. We can think about how heat flow is variable and controllable, uh, how a law of diminishing return applies, that good performance is impossible without fixing our metaphorical bucket, and how patching the biggest hole uh, and, and holes representing heat loss pathways, we need to patch the biggest hole first. So in my own case, this was my leaky bucket. This is my house. And back in 2006, this was my energy use um, across the course of a year, each bar is a month. The red is gas use and the blue is electricity use. 
And that amounts to 80 megajoules of energy across the course of a year. And that was reasonably typical of a house of this type. And this is before I started making changes. So across the course of the next few years, I've gotten that energy use down a lot by plugging holes in my, uh, in the leaky bucket, that's to say improving the thermal envelope and, and other things, um, disconnecting from gas in late 2011. And uh, at the end of this period, um, seven year period, uh, I'm 75% down on where I started from. So just to put that in context, at the end of 2013, I'm using less energy to run the house than I did just to run my hot water in the first year. Um, and that energy is gross energy consumption. So not including energy use or energy gained from the solar panels, which I have and, and they offset that remaining energy consumption completely. So I'm a net energy positive. So that's what, what I think fixing the leaky bucket means. Um, moving on, uh, I wanna uh, use that, build on that by exploring uh, the idea of electricity versus gas uh, and, and how um, electricity is fundamentally different and, and better than gas. So if we consider gas as an energy source, you know, we, we put a match to it and that gives us heat and, and some products of combustion, um, but that's really all. So regardless of what gas is doing as an energy source, uh, that, you know, that, that's what happens. It's a one trick pony. Electricity, on the other hand, um, is fundamentally different. You know, electronics and wires are solid state technology. There's no products of combustion at the point of use. It's intrinsically simpler, more, more reliable and safe than having combustion and bringing gas through pipes. A good example of that is the earth leakage safety switch that all houses now have. And that's a capability that lets us sense with very great precision if there are any leaks. And we can do that because electricity is in a circuit. So we're testing the flow in the in and the out and a difference means a leak and then we, we can open the circuit. So there's no direct equivalent to that in gas. So the next thing about electricity is just how fundamentally versatile it is. Um, and, and the best way of capturing that is the idea that it can be used to carry both energy and information and our whole society runs on energy and information. So um, that, that's quite amazing. Um, building on that, electricity can be directly transformed into, into light, into sound, into heat, into motion, into stored energy. And a lot of those processes are directly reversible. So again, nothing directly comparable uh, uh, when it comes to gas. So we can also generate some of that energy at home from directly from the sun. And our society is being transformed by our digital tech with the internet. And so naturally um, using electricity as an energy source is a much better fit with digital technology than is gas. It supports smart features and it's much easier to meter. And lastly, electrical and electronic systems scale amazingly well. Uh, so we can go from a, heart, a pacemaker to a PV panel all out to a pumped hydro plant. And it's the same fundamental underlying um, uh, physical principles. So where does that leave us? It makes electronics and electrical technology so fundamentally different in its nature compared to, to gas as an energy source. Next, I want to explore the idea of low grade versus high grade energy. Um, so high grade energy gives, uh, is energy that's capable of giving high temperature differences. So gas flames and electric arc furnaces can give temperatures in the thousands of degrees. But for many uses of energy, uh, we just need low grade energy, so, you know, low temperatures, home space heating and domestic hot water are much, much, you know, orders of magnitude lower than that. So don't use high grade energy when low grade heat will do. So why start with uh, thousands of degrees when you need say 25? That's using a sledgehammer to, to crack a nut. Um, so remember what we said about what Paul Hawkins said about aligning with natural forces. So um, 
using high grade energy for low grade heat uses is uh, not aligning well with natural forces. So wouldn't it be great if we had an abundant, free, low grade heat source? Well, actually we do. Um, it, in the ambient air and water that's all around us, there is heat. So let's explore that. Firstly, it's useful to distinguish heat on the one hand from temperature on the other. Uh, let's go back to that bucket analogy. The heat was the water in the bucket and the temperature's um, akin to the, the depth of the water in the bucket. Um, there's low grade heat energy all around us. And most often we're able to uh, use air as a source of heat energy. So the, that heat energy is effectively infinite and renewable. So heat energy is like a fluid. It can move from one place to another and it naturally flows down the hill, the hill being the heat, heat gradient from hot to cold. But we can make machines that force it up the hill, that is move heat from cold places to hot places. We call those machines heat pumps. That's a, where a little bit of electricity moves a lot of heat. So this is my heat pump. Uh, so it's here at my house and most of us would call that reverse cycle air conditioner. So you don't need your mains energy supply to be your source of heat, at least when it comes to low grade heat. So we can just use our high grade heat, our high grade energy like electricity to drive a process that harnesses low grade heat. So that's, that's magicking heat out of, out of thin air literally. And, and it's something that Hawkins would be happy with because it's aligning with natural forces. So moving on, uh, a tale of two grids. We've got parallel electricity grids, electricity and gas. They're separate energy silos and we don't really get that much for having two separate energy grids. We don't get any useful um, fail safe res resilience from, from having that. We just end up with unnecessarily complexity and electricity makes gas increasingly redundant as an energy source. If we could avoid the societal cost of gas, the savings are huge. So that brings us back to this zero carbon as an economic proposition. So the, the whole story and possibility of getting off the gas grid is well beyond the scope of this talk, but I just wanted to set that as, a, as an idea, an idea where people get off gas and there's, there's, uh, there's hundreds or thousands of us in Australia already starting to do that. Um, jump over to My Efficient Electric Home if, if you want proof of that. So someone just connected to electricity only pays a single daily service charge and is, has only one energy account. And, and in this context, the role of the electricity grid is starting to shift. So traditionally we've seen uh, electricity a, a strict, or the electricity grid as strictly being a supply system where customers are, uh, are strictly consumers. But moving forward, the, the role of the grid at least from the point of view of people who generate as well as consume um, is, is that the grid is becoming a sharing system. And that's a fundamental paradigm shift from a supply system to a sharing system. The next point I want to make is about diversification, um, which is important sort of uh, concept to grasp when addressing the question of whether electricity uh, or the grid can cope with more different uses of electricity. So as we start to displace gas with electricity, and petrol with electricity, um, then um, we can take advantage of the fact that there's diversity in the pattern and timing of, of energy use of these different energy loads that they end up allowing us to better utilize, uh, better utilize the asset, which is the grid. So, um, so yes, the grid is going to need um, some love and make, making it um, cope with this extra use, but not by as much as you would think. Because of this diversity um, in smart management, um, we, we can go a surprisingly long way uh, with supporting uh, new energy uses with the, with the amazing grid. So we've got the prospect of diversified energy loads, diversified generation and a comet energy transport, which is the electricity grid. Um, an example is EV loads have different 
uh, peak times to uh, the loads that you might have from your from your home, for example, and that ends up being complementary. So to finish up, um, yes, uh, it's economic. Electrification amounts to aligning with natural forces. And just to, to wrap this up, I want to give an example of replacing a gas ducted system, uh, a gas ducted heating system with uh, split system air conditioning uh, as a heater. So this chart um, shows what would be the case for a gas ducted heating system if we wanted to deliver say 10 megajoules of heat. Um, we need about 33 megajoules of gas from the burner, a bit of electricity to drive the fan, um, but overall it's not very efficient and there's a lot of waste in the process. So uh, if we replace it with a split system uh, for that same amount of usefully delivered heat, uh, we need a, a bit of energy to drive the heat pump. Uh, some to drive the fan, but overall most of the energy that ends up being delivered into the house is being drawn from outside. So the net effect there is uh, a process that's about 13 times more efficient than the one it's replacing. So it's just a profound difference in the nature of how we make use of energy to heat our homes. So even if in, in this hypothetical example, uh, gas per unit of energy is say, half the price of electricity and we've got that ratio of 13. So we're in the order of, we're at least four times better off in terms of the cost of heating our houses. So um, I, I think that helps underscore the value of, um, of using heat pumps, uh, electrification. So let's have a war on waste, a war on waste energy. We electrify our energy system, we'll plug our leaky buckets, and we'll get lots of heat pumps. So that, that concludes my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. What a great introduction. And now we'll ask uh, Bryce to say a few words. He is probably very well known to most AEVIA and Renew members because he's given presentations to us several times before. Most will know he is the secretary of the Victorian branch of AEVIA has been for many years and he's also the author of their national newsletter. So without further ado, over to you Bryce. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, EVs economic and looking a little bit of where they fit in. I'll try and be quick on this because uh, I know that people really would like to get into the Q&A side of it. Um, I always cover a bit of EV terminology to start with because I, EV people tend to throw a lot around. On your left hand side, on the left hand side is the, the two main ones that plug in which is your battery electric vehicle and your plug-in hybrid electric vehicle that's your BEV and your FEV. As you can see there the battery electric vehicle is very simple it's just a battery and electric motor and you put some of that energy back when you're braking as regenerative energy and it gives you a little bit more range. And the same goes for a plug-in hybrid but you have a smaller battery in order to um, and that's backed up by an internal combustion engine or ICE in which case you can go for much longer distances. The battery electric vehicles these days are getting such big batteries that to some degree you don't need that petrol engine anymore. It's been an interim technology. I think in the longer run, they may in fact die out. Uh, the last two on your right, the hybrid electric electric vehicle, the HEV, is your early Priuses and things like that. And they're in fact included in the uh, petrol van or the ICE internal gas combustion engine bands coming up that I'll mention a bit later. And of course, there is the hydrogen car or the fuel cell electric car. It's still an electric car, but it uses hydrogen in a hydrogen tank to convert it to electric and I'll call, convert to electricity through a chemical reaction and run electric motor that way. And I'll come back to that later as to whether they are, they are not economic. Um, I also mentioned EVSEs, uh, sometimes called car chargers. Um, on the left-hand side is your AC ones, ones that can plug in, for instance, through a power outlets that's on your far left and the second on the left is a BYO lead type one where you have your own standard lead and plug in and that's a much more robust socket and the Tesla one in the middle there is a, a typical uh, tethered lead type version and you just plug in your car and on the right are two DC fast charge systems the one that looks like it escaped from lost in space look the robot like one is actually a tritium 50 kilowatt and the boxy one on the far right is in fact a up to 350 kilowatts. If you're charging at those with the next generation cars coming along, you can be charged in about 10 minutes. And given that you're only using those less than 10% of the time when you're away from home, and all the ones on the left are the ones that you're using most of the time, 
they're the ones that you'll be, uh, basically the amount of time you're saving for charging at home makes up for a few extra minutes you're spending on the highway, which you're gonna be popping in for a coffee and a, a toilet break anyway. So electric vehicles have already pretty much broken that time barrier. And I've done a number of trips in my car already to Melbourne, Sydney, Coffs Harbour, et cetera. Um, quick mention that electrification is coming in all its forms and all of those things there you can buy except for the Tesla trucks and the little one down in the right corner, but they actually do exist. Okay, are EVs economic, be it your hip pocket or for the planet? Are they mutually incompatible or are they compatible? That's probably part of the topic for tonight. Okay, as far as economics in your back pocket, yes, they are. You can save here, and as you look at the numbers, $330 in electricity to run a car with 10,000 Ks, an EV, Zoe in this case, or $1,200 in fuel. So looking at your savings in service and what have you, it's about $1,100 per 10,000 kilometers you're gonna be saving. So yes, they certainly save your hip pocket. Do they save for the environment? I'll leave people to perhaps email me for a copy of these slides later, but the short answer is yes. This is even running on grid electricity at the moment. It's comparing a 2017 brand or 2017 Corolla, if you bought one then, versus a 2017 BMW i3, which if you bought in Tasmania, you'll be putting out quarter of a ton of carbon dioxide equivalent driving your 10,000 kilometers versus uh, two tons for a city cycle or one and a half tons for a combined cycle. And you can see for every other state in Australia, it is better for you. Uh, the only exception is Victoria. If you replace it, uh, an EV, uh, petrol, the 2017 Corolla with a EV and drive everywhere, which pretty much I do, um, you would then end up putting out slightly more but that assumes you're not subscribing to green energy or have your own solar panels like I do, which I charge from. And back to that little thing about is the fuel cell electric vehicle hydrogen economic. Um, if you charge an electric car, the BEV, from 100 kilowatt hours of electrical renewable energy, you'll get about 69 kilowatt hours of usable on the road turning of wheels. If you drive your fuel cell electric vehicle and you compress the gas only and transport, you know, basically refine it, compress it, transport it, use it in your fuel cell, you'll get about 23. And if you end up liquefying it to get to your fuel cell car, about 19%. So I always argue that at the moment, the hydrogen fuel economy has nowhere to go as yet because it's simply too inefficient to be running on our, on our very limited renewable supplies. Okay, for consumption and driving of new materials, there's always the issue of, is it a new car versus secondhand versus conversion, or even should you be using a car at all and maybe pick up a smaller EV, a bike, a scooter, many things, cargo bikes, a lot of these things that we talked about in the EV conference that I mentioned earlier. I'll quickly scoot into this next section, which is why is there such a low EV uptake? So I just wanna bring these things up for people to think about and ask questions in, in the Q and A. In Australia, the adoption of electric vehicles is being held back by the lack of policy support or incentives, higher upfront costs, lack of choice, and the availability of public vehicle charging infrastructure. And that was in 2008. We do have more choice. The prices are coming down a bit and there is more infrastructure around, but given or comparing to the rest of the world, it is very much still the case. Uh, however, promoting EV uptake, what does it take? Well, it's carrots, sticks, and policy. And just to throw you a few examples, carrots around the world, you can have one-off subsidies to encourage EV purchases. You can have uh, workplace charging schemes that the UK government has brought in. They also invest in uh, developing uh, the technology. So there's all sorts of seed funding. There's all sorts of things. I, I have a whole presentation I can do on this whole topic. This is just one slide I pinched out of it. For big sticks or for sticks, various countries are trying to stop selling internal combustion engines. They are banning the sales. And Norway is only five years away. Uh, Holland, 2025 as well. And then you're getting to places with significant car industries, England, France, India, they're starting to ban them as well. So long-term, if we don't go EV, we'll have to start importing old petrol cars and start repairing them, much like becoming Cuba of the South Pacific, which is a bit dispiriting. Uh, policy, I'll briefly cut, there's, there's so many things that we could do that we're not doing. National EV fleet targets, government fleet purchasing, half the fleet, half the EV market, oh, sorry, half the vehicle market in Australia is fleet purchases. And that's where a lot of us buy our cars from in second hand. If they were start starting to buy EVs and, and prioritised EVs, such as the ACT is doing, there would be a good uh, flow of steady flow of secondhand EVs coming in over the next few years for 
the rest of the public to buy. Funding for education, we in AIVA do a lot of education and familiarization campaigns, but we are only a volunteer organization and we can only do so much. We try to do, we're punching above our weight, as I'll mention a bit further down this presentation. There's all sorts of things and there are changes coming in tenancy laws and building codes. Biggest one at the moment is emission standards overseas. That is what's driving a lot of the EV uptake in Australia. We're way behind. And I could go on about that, but I shan't. If you want to find out more, you can join us at the Australian Electric Vehicle Association. That website's there. And again, if you want a copy of this presentation, my uh, email address is at the end of it. Um, and we have a whole lot of fact sheets available for each of the EV battery electric vehicle models as they're available, made available on the market. And there's also a sheet listing all the, the basic features, prices of the BEVs and FEVs available in Australia. If you really want to dig a bit deeper, we are running the 2020 EV Vision e-conference on Friday 27th of November. We have a main intro, plenary sessions, there's 45 speakers, we've got Tim Flannery speaking, we have Robert Llewellyn from Fully Charged speaking. We have a number of international speakers from Electric Vehicle Associations and other reports. It's a really big conference, the biggest that's been run in Australia so far in EVs, whether it be online or in person. Uh, as we say here, the future is clear, EVs are here. Also, um, this one's for Robin. I threw this slide in for him. It's a Nilimic EV forum is coming up in about a week or so's time. The website's there. I'm sure someone will pop that up in the chat if you're interested. Um, anyway, the burning questions I'll leave to the end because that's coming up. We have Craig who will give us a really interesting talk after we've um, been babbling on for so long and then we can get into the Q&A. Robin, I'll fling back to you and you can hand over to Craig. Thank you, Bryce. That was great. What a great introduction. And now I'll just introduce Craig, which is um, really not required because he's so well known for all his TV series. Uh, particularly the one on waste and uh, fight for planet A and the currently running one big weather but also lots of ones in previous times and the chasers and the like. So uh, I think we'll just go straight over to you Craig. Thank you Robin, uh, thanks for having me here. Um, in many ways I don't know why I'm talking to you guys because it kind of goes against my general approach in this in that I a lot of the time what I'm trying to do is I guess take the expertise of groups such as you guys and translate it into real simplicity and try to make it, take it to the kind of, I try not to preach to the choir. I'm trying to speak to people who don't understand this stuff and <clears throat> trying to make it easy and trying to make it seem non-threatening as well in a lot of ways. I would say that there's pretty much probably no one on this call who isn't probably more of an expert than me on most of these issues. Uh, yeah, and that's why I'm not going to speak specifically about the technical sides of this. I guess more about I, what people such as yourselves, who I guess are the early adopters, can do to help promote this and make it more of a common thing. I think that's what we really want to be doing. I want to be making sure that this stuff becomes the norm uh, rather than the exception. And I think that uh, people like yourselves, the kind of early adopters are important in a couple of ways. <clears throat> I think per firstly, you know, if you're talking about, for instance, the economic question, being able to say, look, oh, wow, I've done this and it saves me this much money or it saves this kind of thing or it saves me this many tonnes of emissions or whatever, just being able to communicate that positive story, I think, to other people is a really important part of it. And I think sometimes it's also just also being very wary of the fact that to a general population, I think a lot of the kind of more tech side of things is scary rather than invigorating and interesting. Uh, and it's about how you can kind of take that knowledge that you have and communicate in a really simple way so that people don't feel like they don't have the kind of expertise to get there. And really having, you know, places like Renew are just essential to having the expertise that people can turn to if they want to take these steps themselves. That's a really important part of it. I think the other thing that's really important for the kind of first adopters, the early adopter community, particularly because they generally have a higher level of expertise and understanding, is actually also about ironing out the kinks so that when the kind of less tech, less understanding people join, their journey is kind of made clearer. Like, for instance, you know, like, I think that it's interesting, actually, when I was, I was quite surprised when I was in Sweden and driving an electric car 
by what an absolute nightmare it was that every different charger I went to was different and it was just it was, it was quite difficult at times. You know, being there to be able to kind of lead the debate and lead the policy debate with 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 governments or councils or whoever's doing it and being able to kind of put in place the most simple system that's going to be able to work for the biggest amount of people, no matter what their expertise or understanding or that kind of thing. I think that's a really important thing. So I think you should be seeing yourselves as kind of forging that direction. I, I, I think that the infrastructure is a really big thing. And it's been mentioned tonight that that kind of lack of infrastructure there at the moment for a lot of people, for me, for instance, I, you know, I don't have off street parking. I can't charge an electric car as much as I'd actually love to. I really think you, you kind of, it's that thing of we need to really push for that infrastructure to become normal. So it's, but you see it in the streets. You see it not just on the main highways. You see electric infrastructure, for instance, being a normal part of your community. In a way, it's a kind of chicken and egg. The politicians are like, well, I don't, why should I bother putting out this infrastructure? So few people have electric cars. And it's like, well, you need to put it out to encourage people to kind of to normalise it, to make it seem like, oh, this is the way it's going. This is what's going to happen. So it's about making these things seem like not only desirable, I think it's very important to make things seem desirable, but also to make them seem easy, to make it seem a simple thing, I think is really important to do. And yes, look, Bryce has touched on this already. The lack of uh, policy direction in Australia is extraordinary. I was just, uh, I've, I've just been writing a book about and touching on this. And I love it. I went through, I uh, compared Europe and Australia from like, early 90s uh, from when they started with voluntary emission standards to their current standard and then did a column that showed all the Australian approaches and pretty much the only thing we've done is put out about six or seven different discussion papers like every few years we put out a new discussion paper and I, you know I don't want to play that down every few years it's got a better font there's more pictures in them, but they basically say the same thing and we never then actually implement them. So it's a very frustrating position to be in in Australia. And of course, one of the reasons we have low supply of these kind of vehicles is the fact that without the demand, you've got waiting lists in so many countries for EVs. Why the hell would you be shipping them to Australia when there's no encouragement, no policy, pull on that kind of thing? So I think that, that as we kind of wait for some kind of policy or as you kind of lobby for kind of policy change there, starting to build the infrastructure, starting to kind of work with councils. It's interesting how when I went to speak to my, my local council about electric cars and infrastructure, uh, a, a neighbour of mine who's got an electric car, who's who got a lot of expertise, had already spoken to them and kind of started that conversation. And it's interesting by the fact that it was like somebody had already started that conversation, so they'd like to it, and then I started talking to them about it. And that's an important part of it, I think, is just getting in the ear of policymakers and not making it seem hard, but making it seem like there's a lot of people out here, you know, oh, wow, people, people keep coming up to me going, why don't we have more EV infrastructure, you know? Why don't we have this kind of thing? I think that's a really important part of what's happening. So the, the lobbying work that you guys do is really important as well. But... Yeah, I guess you're an essential part of uh, uh, being a source of expertise for when people come to you, but also recognise that when you're communicating to a broader community, you want to make it seem a lot more simple than maybe when you're talking to the kind of tech, more commu that community. And that's one of the big challenges, I think, as we go forward is how to make it seem like the simple solution to our problems, both economic and definitely environmental as well. Uh, I won't go on too much longer because we'd love to hear questions and have take questions. So, uh, yeah, let's go to questions. Thank you, Craig. Great. So, yes, we'll go to questions. Um, we've got one general one coming on um, what surprised people. So maybe we'll start with you, Craig, first. What surprised you? doing all your research and development for uh, Planet A and Big Weather, which then made you change things in the final production, so. Um, what surprised me? Look, the moment, that, the moment that surprised me the most in filming Fight for Planet A was probably when we were in Tasmania at the um, Cape Grimm facility that best measures carbon dioxide and you know that's there because it gets the cleanest air that comes across the ocean 
And I think, you know, I was, they were talking about how much higher it was when it came across Melbourne. And I think I was quite surprised by that because I think I've always perceived CO2 as being fairly regular around the world. But how much it actually changed when the, the wind just changed across Melbourne, you know, across a, a place like that. But the thing that actually surprised me was not that, was that when I asked about uh, what about when the air comes across uh, Tasmania and they said it actually drops below the standard when it comes across the ocean and that's because it's coming off a land that has no coal small amount of uh, cars massive amount of trees so they're pulling down CO2 as it goes and you went it's really interesting that there's an example there of a kind of microcosm that shows that if we do the right things if we can move to the place where we go oh we don't use fossil fuels here we've got lots of trees we've got low polluting cars we can actually be really having an impact directly and immediately as we go. So that's the thing that I think made me most, it was also probably made me feel a bit more positive about it as well. Uh, yeah. Great one. And um, for people you interviewed and such like, um, their lack of understanding about climate change and its <laughs> impacts, was that common? Um, yeah, look, it's interesting because I, you know, look, I've, you know, got Renew for ages and I'm, I'm kind of, a, I'm not as tech as some of you guys, but I'm kind of into that side of it. And I think where I thought the show would be, would be pitched up here, like in terms of, you know, what we'd be communicating. And when we started making it and started talking to the kind of general population about issues, I realised, no, if you start, you know, you have to go way back here because a lot of people are kind of missing out at the first level. There's a real misunderstanding about CO2 and where it comes from. There's a lot of polling showing people are like, oh, what do you do to stop carbon, you know, global warming? They're like, oh, I don't take a plastic bag of coals. It's like, that's a great thing, but that's not necessarily really linked to fossil fuels and all that kind of stuff. So I think well, I had to go back really to real basics uh, to try and get to that community that's a, you know, not already on the journey. Those people that probably say, I really am concerned about climate change. I want to do something, but then are pretty stuck straight away. So it was probably, <clears throat> you know, it was a lot more simple than I would have thought, to be honest. Um, and things like, even like, even things like, it's interesting, he's saying tonight, um, like even just people not even, you know, even when you get to cars, like people would have no idea what a hybrid is compared to a, you know, battery, all any of these kind of things. Like you get a hybrid, people are like, how do you charge it? You know, there's all these kind of very simple things that you, you presume. It's actually a really tough thing because what I think you need to do is almost, if you're talking to somebody who's not nearly as, has the same expertise, you kind of have to rob yourself a lot of your knowledge and take yourself back to what did I, what did I believe at the very beginning of this? Uh, you know, that's the kind of, you know, how do you communicate without that really simple level? And that can be really hard, I think. And Richard, um, yeah. how about what surprises you about people's misunderstanding about um, home energy efficiency and what can be done? Uh, well, when I assess people's houses, um, Probably the biggest surprise people have is just how bad things are to start with. In other words, people don't realise just what they're missing. Um, and, and when you get a thermal imaging camera and you start to show them you know, these big thermal holes in their in their in their ceiling, it, it, it's a big light light bulb moment for people. So yeah having things like thermal imaging and, and other ways of illustrating to people uh, the nature of the problem is really powerful. Hmm. Great. And Bryce, on electric vehicles, what's the greatest misunderstandings about that? Uh, well, strangely enough, my, the greatest misunderstanding is what the meaning of a kilowatt hour is and trying to get that across that it's there is a difference between the amount of energy at mobile phone draws and uh, that a car draws and that it is a significant difference in terms of uh, recharging and the amount of energy to use and what it does to your bill or doesn't do to your bill so it's as a science educator I mean, my background is science and i'm actually a qualified secondary teacher and i work at the school of engineering so i do a lot of work in in around that sort of area but it's um getting it across to the public is, is quite hard and I have to come up with quite a number of different ways of trying to explain it. I hope I do it properly, but I, uh, it's, it's always a difficult one. 
in what context are you answering that question? What's the person's question that leads to that conversation? Uh, it's often they're trying to recharge from a PowerPoint their car and wonder why it takes a couple of days with some of the larger batteries and things like that, or why does their PowerPoint melt? Um, and then you're trying to explain that you know, a PowerPoint was never meant to draw 10 amps for 20 hours or more. If you're recharging a Kona, for instance, it would take 28 hours at 10 amps to get there. And going, an ordinary three pin PowerPoint was never meant to do that. Why does the house potentially start burning down? Because the wiring was never installed to take that sort of load. All wiring calculations were done. I'm also an electrician and used to teach this stuff to apprentice electricians, saying you had a diversity factor where the wire would be for the toaster would be running an electric kettle be running for a couple of minutes and then it would cool down again and then you might run it again and the cable warms up and cools down if you're running current through it all the time especially in summer when there's a higher ambient heat around it the cable doesn't cool down it gets hotter and hotter and goes over its temperature and starts to melt or may overheat a connection and that's why you should use a proper evsc or electric car charger for your general charging at home because it's made for it it's wired back to your switchboard it's a very a lot of people just go, oh, it's just extra money to spend and say, this is why you do it because the wiring, if it's done properly, is perfectly safe and it's really convenient. If you just try and charge from a PowerPoint all the time, it's not going to go the distance. You'll be replacing a number of PowerPoints and plugs and you may burn your house down. Very important, yeah. And a question from Zada to Craig. Uh, do we need to make the green message deep and emotional? as well as simple to understand and easy to access. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like the interesting thing is that people respond on different levels. And one of the difficult things for me making a show for the ABC is it's a broadcast it's to everyone. So you've got people who are already panicked beyond belief about climate change and can't believe, you know, like the problem, their problem is that the anxiety levels are really high. And then you've got another group of people who are watching the same show who are kind of like, this climate change thing, it doesn't I don't feel like it's really that bad for me yet, you know, it, it feels like it's down the road. So I think you do need to do, an, uh, you know, you need to definitely make an emotional um, bid, but you've got to realise that you don't want to also stress the hell out of those people who, um, you know, I, I, this is why I wanted to make a show that also had solutions in it, because I'm very wary of, I think there's been a lot of uh, climate change documentaries or other which kind of make people very frightened by the end of it but that make them feel like it's just all this fright and there's nothing that can be done and i think you need to not only make people you know emotionally go along with the journey but you also need to make them know that we can actually uh, get good change get positive change i guess and your next question is uh, what's the reaction been like to big weather and planet a in the middle of covid is the audience still interested in climate change? This is from Tim. Uh, yeah. It's interesting. I think it's definitely been uh, a, a more muted to a point. I mean, there's been a good response to it. To be honest, I think Big Weather Struggle is more based on Junior MasterChef than due to COVID. But, uh, but I do think that Melbourne particularly is a very, much more sustainable kind of place in general and what we were interested in sustainability and the fact that kind of they came in the midst of the second wave was probably not ideal. I think there was a, a lot of people for whom felt emotionally, I've got enough on my plate here than have to think about climate change as well. Uh, but yeah, look, generally speaking, there's been a great response and it's been interesting actually. I think that we, one of the nice things about it is I think we've moved along and to the point whereby, you know, we could make an ABC documentary that didn't even have to deal with the question of whether or not climate change is real. You know, we didn't even d debate that. And there was very little pushback against that as well, which was a wonderful thing to see. So I think the debate underlying community debate has moved on a little bit. You mentioned Victoria there. Is it different between the states then and different regions of the country? I think that, I think that Victoria is, there's a probably a stronger general sustainability feel in, in a sense there um ironic given that they have the worst grid by far i mean it's funny as bryce put out I, one of the things i found very tragically ironic i think <clears throat> i looked back at this a year or so ago and i think uh, victoria had the highest take up of 
EVs and also the worst grid for the charging of EVs at the same time. As I said, I think a lot of people don't, a lot of people get green power or charge of solar. But it's interesting, one of the questions in here, David Poor asks, is a petrol hybrid still an okay compromise during this stage of the transition, especially when you can't charge off your home solar? The reality is that if you buy a, you know, if you buy a Toyota hybrid, a Corolla or a RAV, it's got a smaller carbon footprint than buying a Tesla three and charging that off the grid in most of the country, or at least in general, the average of the country. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you can't, you know, we need to move towards EVs long-term, but you can do things in the meantime that can substantially reduce your footprint, but that aren't the kind of end goal there. I think that's an important thing to recognize. I think, to be honest, I think that the, <clears throat> And it's probably a criticism I make of our own show, actually, is we probably should have looked a little bit more at hybrids and plug-in hybrids and that as well, because that's going to be a big part of the market. It's interesting, in Nordic, in, in Nordic countries, plug-in hybrids are still, some of them are the biggest sale item there, rather than battery EVs as well. So I think that, you know, you, yeah, you need to recognise that it's about making the best, best truck you can. You may not be able to do the best best, but it's still good to do the kind of changes that actually do make a difference. And Bryce, do you want to come in on that one? Uh, yeah, that's, it's always a way of, we're moving forward. There's, it's always an end point keeps moving further and further in front of us to try and get to zero. So any step we can make to improve things has got to be a good one. So plug-in hybrids at the moment, given the price of batteries or battery vehicles, is a good stepping stone. There's some good second-hand plug-in hybrids around that are well worth looking at. But I think and they're certainly Norway, better than driving a big old uh, diesel four-wheel drive. Yep. So I think Norway was going 2025 to be electric and mm. no PEVs after 2030. Yeah, no, yeah, that's right. There's no PEVs either by that. The PEVs are still allowed. They're an interim technology. Um, and there's nothing uh, intrinsically bad about them, apart from the fact that they still need some fossil fuel at some stage. Some of the people that had them, when they got them, were finding that the petrol was going stale in them because they discovered that an EV would have done what they wanted they didn't need to do that interim step and a lot of people with these days as battery car prices come down will find they can go straight from a petrol car to the battery they're talking about 2024 will be the start of the crossing point of parity of pricing for a full battery versus its comparable internal combustion engine and by 2028 all the segments of vehicles will have made that cross that point and the ones that went first will be cheaper than a petrol car because that sort of technology is intrinsically cheaper than a petrol car it costs, it actually takes, sadly, it takes about a third less labour to build an electric car than it does a um, petrol car. And back to Craig, what's the title of your new book, David? <laughs> uh, fight for Planet A. <laughs> Creatively named. And that's it's, not, it's not out yet, but you can pre-order it. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, it kind of, it, 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 t it goes off the back of Fight for Planet. It's amazing how, as I said earlier, that thing about that, despite having three hours of TV, we went so much less deep than I would have liked to have. So I've tried to kind of try and at least take the next level down or the next couple of levels down in the book to give a bit more detail to people who kind of start on the journey and want to get no more. Uh, again, you know, yeah, it, it, it kind of looks at technical stuff and what you can do yourself, but also has a bit more of probably a run at the um, appalling history of, general climate policy in Australia. And uh, <laughs> so it's extraordinary, some of the examples, actually. Nuts. And there won't be a Planet A for stage two? Uh, not so there won't be, not at the moment. Uh, we'll, we'll see. I'd like to do that at some point, actually, to kind of go that next step, you know, to get a bit more into kind of, you know, again, like housing and, you know, greenhouses and what you can do and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, we really went that first level to try and get people to engage, to understand it, to be honest. To, to <clears throat> the main aim of the show is for people to really understand it and to go, oh, we can do this, there's technology there, we can change. But, yeah, we didn't go into kind of the, the full depth of that. And one for all of you is I'm wondering what the considerations are when, cons when installing solar panels in a bushfire-prone area. This is from Chris. Don't know if you want to go for that or... Richard would probably know. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd make a comment. The, um, 
Bushfire prone areas in their nature usually have a lot of shading. So the main thing is it's harder to find a space on a roof that's less likely to be impacted by shade. So in a, in a bushfire prone area, you're probably more likely to need to have microinverters to deal with shade. Um, but aside from that, um, uh, no, I, I can't think of any other factors. Um, no, there's, there there's is no, a factor. There's no, no such thing as bell rating on a, on a solar panel. Yeah, the, more, the only factor is probably if you get battery. And I know that um, having been at a house that just survived a fire and had batteries, and the, I know that the, um, the fireys were talking about, <clears throat> they had to kind of really check that out when they got there. But um, no. Right, yeah. And do we think the carbon thing is being widely and properly taught in our education system? This is from Albert. Alfred and Margie. I might put my hand up, start on that one purely because I actually wrote a year 11 maths textbook that's still in use. And one of the chapters is how to calculate your carbon budget. Um, so yes, <laughs> if anybody's looking for foundation mathematics, a Victorian v a VCE subject is actually a whole subject, a whole chapter on doing just that. I'm not sure how much further it goes in science, but I know it, it's, it's covered at least there. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> I mean, I, I don't think it's taught nearly enough. And I think there's a needs to be a lot more education of that and probably needs to be a starting step is more education of teachers as well of that area as well. You know, it's, it's, in, it's interesting how the, the hardest thing about communicating climate change problems is that is there's this unseen element of it is that the enemy is an unseen element, CO2, you know, or methane or gas it's much harder for people to engage with that than something like waste, which is, you know, you know, you see it in your kitchen, you see it in the, the ocean, that kind of thing. So I think that's one of the hard things. I think the more education we can have in early stages of people understanding that, the easier it will be long-term in terms of policy and changes. And is it easier in countries where there's a more positive government policy than the education system follow? <laughs> the sad thing about Australia is that our debate got massively politicised and polarised kind of mainly around the kind of Abbott period. And that has put us back so many years in terms of our response to climate change. It was interesting being in Sweden and being there for weeks and realising at the end, at no stage did I have a conversation with anyone from any side of politics or any side of the debate who didn't start with a basis of climate change as a problem what are the solutions we're looking at? They were arguing about the solutions. They weren't arguing about climate change. And Australia, unfortunately, has been caught uh, years back because of that kind of polarisation and the fact that it became seen as a political thing. I think we're moving a little bit past that now. We see at state levels, Liberal and Labor governments kind of pushing ahead of that, which is good. And I think that's an important part of changing that debate. But unfortunately, yeah, Australia's been caught up. We obviously have a, a stronger fossil fuel lobby and part of our economy as well, which I think has also held us back overall. But I don't think it's necessarily the underlying education that's held us back. All right. And a question for Bryce. Mm. Will it ever be mechanically possible and economically possible to convert your second hand, your second car, ice car, into an EV? So you can uh, purchase a complete new vehicle. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's perfectly feasible, but it's economically crazy. Uh, it is already cheaper to buy a second-hand EV for around 20 grand or less, say an old Leaf or an old Amiv, than it is to spend 30 to 40 grand converting something that'll give you the same range, but be far less um, trustworthy and reliable. I mean, if you do a really good job, it would be almost as good, but you can actually buy a car for half the price it would cost you to convert. On the other hand, converting classics or something that's, that's sort of a fun old car, uh, that's definitely the way to go to, to, to keep those things going. So there's some, I've seen some nice conversions of MGBs, Jaguars, that type of thing. And that there'll always be a market for converting classics, but the days of converting a day-to-day -day driver, like we used to do 12 years ago, and, and older than that, no, nah, that, that, that day is gone now. No, no one's converting them as the three. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a Mazda 2 done and done very, very well, but it cost them two million. <laughs> it got cost them two million dollars. Exactly. There were some Commodores converted, nine of them, and it cost their, their setup and conversion cost was twenty-seven million. 
they weren't exactly impressed when I pointed out that equated to $3 million a car. Yeah. All right. That's how much it costs to do. If you're really going to engineer a modern, you can't actually convert a car after 2011 because of the electronic stability control programs and things. There's so much engineering to do and so much demonstrating of that it works with the ESC and doesn't throw the car off the road that you can't even try. Not that sort of big boys. That that was the EV engineering nine Commodores or the that Mazda two I mentioned. And are second hand EVs readily available? And how about the imported ones? Are they reasonable? That's a good question. The, the only issue with the second hand EVs is they are the older generation, so they only have around a hundred a kilometer range and actually looking at the Teslas, which are much the same, even second hand Tesla is looking at the same sort of prices and you something else. So if you need something for short range, the older ones are quite good. And you, starting from 10 grand up, you can pick up something. The issue is if you want something that does everything that your current fossil car does, like my Kona, which I can drive Melbourne, Sydney, to Coffs Harbour, Tamworth, Dubbo, I've been all over the place in it. Um, you, there is no second hand car at the moment available. Wait five years, they'll be available. What about so, the kind of secondary imports? I heard somebody trying to talk that up the other day because there's so little stock coming into Australia. They're talking about getting it. Is that a, a valid route or not? Uh, in New Zealand, that, that's very much been a, a market and has been a, a established market for some years. In Australia, it's only just beginning and they're to do it privately yourself it's really hard there's a lot of paperwork there's a lot of things can, can go wrong uh, a car can get damaged in transit the car might turn up and discover it, it'll be stolen um, from japan or whatever or it may have been a cut and shut you know major repair job um, if you've got a good agent over there and good shipping arrangements and a good engineer here to approve it which is what some of the a good car company for instance are setting up to do that and they will bring in good japanese cars there's, there's, there's nothing really wrong with that. And it does increase the stock of secondhand cars. At the moment, they're not a lot cheaper than buying a secondhand one in Australia, Australian deliver one, if you can get hold of one. Or if you want something that is similar to what's brought here in Australia, like the ENV van, it's an ENV van, which is basically a leaf in van drag. Um, it's well worth bringing them in because the good car company is setting up local mechanics that can work it. That's the, the other problem is finding someone to work on these cars once they're here. Yeah, a factor in that equation is the plug standards. Um, Japan, for better or worse, is sort of doubled down on the Chatamo standard for DC charging and the Type 1 plug for AC charging, and so that, which has become a legacy um, sort of standard in Australia where we're going CCS for, 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 for DC charging and Type 2 for AC charging. So. Sure, you can bring in a, a decent, um, fairly recent leaf out of Japan, but it, the plug compatibility is going to be poor. Um, it, it, it actually, there isn't really an issue. For AC charging, it's by an adapter, and I, I had one for my old leaf because um, it was type 1. The new leaves are, in fact, type 2 anyway, and um, the Japanese ones will be all type 1 still because that's what they use. Yeah. But it's, it's, an easy, it's only about a hundred or so dollar adapter to plug into a type 2 charger, and all the DC chargers are still being fitted with Chatamo, even though it is a legacy plug now, even this and giving it up. But for the next five to 10 years, at least, the Chatamo DC will still be um, around to use on all the chargers available on the highways. Um, mm. will, you, will there be a conversion plug after that as well? Mm, uh, technically, no. Okay. That, that's the official answer. I've got, a, I've got a question. It comes up for one of the questions. But somebody says, David Gill says, please talk about the benefit of buying 100% green power for clean electricity, which I'm a very big supporter of and is fa fantastic if you can't do the other uh, methods. Question, which Bryce might be to answer or somebody else might, because I've asked this of Tesla and haven't got an answer yet, is do they subscribe to 100% green power for their charging stations? Good question. I, I know ChargeFox. Do they, they, they do? Oh, they yeah, do. I was wondering about Tesla, and I, I must admit, I got very blank looks when I asked that question, despite the fact I thought it was the most obvious question. To yeah, ask. it's a very good question. I'll, um, next time I speak to someone from Tesla, I'll, I'll follow it up. Did you want good. to buy in there, Richard? No, no, <laughs> short, <Sure, that's> sweet. <laughs> um. A question from Dale for Craig. How can we harness our recent COVID response? I'm thinking about all the exponential graphs I've seen on the news 
to the climate change response needed? Yeah, look, I think, you know, and this has been said a lot, I, I do think that having the model of a period in time where governments work together with expertise and experts and follow that model and it worked for us is, is a good one to have there. Um, my concern, my concern with COVID is really that the kind of job situation is going to be used as an excuse to kind of, you know, I, I, I liken this to the taco ads, you know, where they're like, why not have both? It's going to be the approach of going, yeah, yeah, we'll have green, you know, we'll put money into green jobs and all that kind of stuff, but we really need to have gas led econ- you know, recovery and all that kind of stuff as well. And I think that's unfortunately going to be the narrative that's used to justify a lot of retrograde policy that really goes backwards in time. Uh, uh, so that's my concern in terms of COVID. I do think there's been some positive things coming out. I think that it's changed. It will change the way we travel and do meetings and that kind of thing. That's not a, the biggest part of our footprint, but it's, you know, it has an impact. Uh, so I think there's been some positives come out of it, although I have some concerns about its impact on where we go forward. I suppose developing on that, if you were um, Prime Minister or Finance uh, this applies to all of you. Uh, what would you have done in the budget different to what they did recently? Yeah, I would have been. I would have been. I would have been directing money to places that had numerous benefit effects. Ben, you know, benefits such as jobs, as well as benefits for the environment long term. One of the things that I think is frightening about investing, you know, things like gas led recovery, is to be honest that I think that that money will end up being thrown away and 10 years down the track we'll be regretting that and it will be wasted money wasted investments um unfortunately that generally it's in areas that uh high capital intensive have to run for a very long period to be paid them back and because they're high capital intensive they're also low jobs so yeah and bryce or richard want to respond to that too yeah, um, well, electrification needs a, a huge policy focus, though. Whether you frame that as getting off gas or just doubling down on on electricity as our primary energy carrier, um, that amounts to the same thing. But yeah, we just need to start addressing all the policy questions that, that flow from that naturally. One of the things that is interesting, because if you actually look at the breakdown of Australia's gas, you know, the amount we use in our houses is tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of it. And one of the concerns I have is that people misunderstand the debate about gas and mass extraction as if we're talking about the stuff you're using in your house. We're not really. We're talking about whether you're using it in the grid and we're talking about its export and the impact that has on um, the cost of it. So it's really, I think gas companies use the notion of when we talk about this gas as if it's the gas we use to, you know, cook some, boil some bloody eggs, which is nothing to do really with the actual broader gas policy, to be honest. Yeah, well, the whole gas export thing and that's... Oh. Where do you start? Where do you I was, start? I was, yes, I was going to say my approach to the, what, what I was just about it should have been, I think I made a couple of notes there, it was just have an energy policy for once instead of in a policy to do nothing about it and let the market rain. Um, basically get a policy that will move to carbon zero and put in um, policy settings that actually smooth the transition to where we have to be with net carbon zero and that involves electric vehicles, a green grid, et cetera, et cetera. And then we can move along the way and all, all the states and everybody else will be rowing in the same direction at the moment. We have all well-meaning states and local government authorities and things paddling away and all paddling off in different directions. And we need an overarching federal policy setting to say, this is where we're going. This is the general settings that we'd be going. Now you can all go away and do beaver away in the same direction, keep chipping at the same wall. Yeah, but Fortunately, at the federal that. level now, energy policy is like the bomb that has to be diffused because generally it blows up the leader at the mm. time. So <laughs> I think there's a lack of political will there, which is unfortunate. Yeah. I don't think it's necessary to blow up the leader at the time but maybe no. that's how it's been handled exactly all the pressures within the current coalition parties um 
they, they keep moving the, uh, the questions on me. Um, just so I'm going to have to go in five too, just because. Okay. Uh, from Richard, many of us have been working in this area for years. What do you think is the best thing we can do to move renewables forward into the broader community? I mean, yeah. yeah. The, Craig, you're busting to say something there. No, no, you go, go, I'll, I'll follow you. Move renewables. Well, in some respects, things are going really well. Rooftop solar is going gangbusters and, and existing policies to support that aren't too bad. Um, what we could do to make that better is um, improve policies to help landlords put solar on rental properties, um, better policies to, uh, to encourage um, businesses to get it, um, but to, to be honest, businesses that aren't looking to get it in the first place, uh, <laughs> the incentives are pretty strong. As the, you know, the, the, the economics make sense today, um, so yeah, but that that's the interesting thing, and I totally agree about the rental thing. And it's interesting that when Victoria brought in their new solar policy, there, uh, the the ones that were for owner operated houses and that went in a second. And yet months later, the rental ones are still sitting there and almost untouched. And that's because still, they still haven't figured out how to do that in a way that works for the landlord and for the, the um, tenants as well. So that's a great one to both. I, I would say, look, I totally agree. There's all of the incentives there. The thing that I found, I had this today. I had a friend call me up going, oh, we really want solar. The thing that I find, and this is where I think it really, your community is very important is I know a massive amount of people who care about this, who go, oh, we went to get solar a few years ago. And what they do is they hit the first level is they call up a couple of places and they get a bit swamped. And they also get, because there are a few charlatans out there, they get the kind of real sales heavy people out there. And they just kind of, after a week of trying to do it or after a day of doing it, they go, this is too hard. I don't, I don't know who to trust and I don't know what the correct answer is. And I think that having groups like Renew and that who has, can, people can turn to and get simple answers and go, these are the people to trust, these are the questions to ask, these are the answers you're looking for. And the more simple that is, the better. I think that's a real, really important thing because I know a lot, I know, I've met many people on my journeys who know they would have saved money through solar, who want to do it environmentally, but who just can't get through that kind of first step of how to actually do it and i think that that being able to being able to install that that cycle of trust is actually a really important one and i think that's probably where the community groups can be of great value yeah and the community council purchasing plans and the like perhaps yeah. one more question for you craig before you head off um we were all Fascinated by you driving a Tesla at some incredible speed. Can you, can you tell us a bit about the experience? <laughs> yeah, it's and interesting because, um, of course, the reality was is that I, you know, I kind of almost didn't want to do that because I thought it was a bit done. But I did it because I wanted to. The main reason I did it was two twofold. The two two reasons I did it. One, I actually wanted to answer the question. I wanted to put the balloons on the cars and show that electric cars, even when charged off a grid in Australia, were still better. And I wanted to then show that thing of, but if you then charge them for renewable, we're talking about like almost zero, you know, carbon travel. I wanted to show people that that was a possibility. Uh, but also I think it is the truth that, you know, the ridiculousness of the last election where we did see all this stuff about people, Australians like a bit of grunt and that, it was responding to that and saying, look, we've got to make it so that people understand that this is a, you know, a lot of people who love cars, they, it's nothing about exactly how much it costs them. It's about the fact that they love cars. And actually I thought the best bit about that was the fact that the guy who was the kind of vice president of the, the Holden HSV club, David Sultana, I thought his response was the most best part about it. Cause he, as a rev head was like, Oh wow, this is going to be great. 
and that was the kind of thing to go that was the most important part of it but uh having said that the actual driving of it we didn't we <laughs> we couldn't get any time to practice it or anything so i was petrified and it was <laughs> i knew that i should win but the ability to really hold your foot down when you're going at that pace is uh yeah without any practice i got to say it was uh slightly frightening on the day you, i'm just saying it's lucky you have to put into that mode because if you had ludicrous mode on your trip to pick up the kids from daycare <laughs> it could be quite dangerous but did you have fun a hell of a lot of fun i mean it's absolutely brilliant cars this is it you know I, I, I don't even have a driveway to charge a car in, let alone that. But if, and the price is well and truly ahead of me. But my God, I would love one of those cars. They're incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And this is it. I mean, part of it's interesting how Tesla 3 coming through now, uh, I'm sure you've seen the same thing. You see a hell of a lot more of them on the road. And that's mm. part of it. And this is the thing is we kind of we need to go from that first early adopter to it growing slightly further. And then it gets to a certain tipping point. And we don't have that in Australia, but we need to be pushing towards that. And obviously there's a lot of constraints on that. But the more people out there with electric cars on the streets and talking about how great it is, the quicker it's going to grow. I've seen curves drawn where um, the uptake of various technology, mobile phones, refrigerators, air conditioners, and they all sort of start off slowly. And that's where EVs in Australia are. And they start kicking up. And I think it's around 7 8% you get that just things just suddenly start to take over and it's just everybody has one else there's that famous pair of pictures in i think it's in new york between 1900 and 1910 or 1910 and 1920 where one was all horse and cart and 10 years later at the same spot was all all car all horse and cart except one car and the next picture was all cars except for one horse and cart when it reaches that tipping point it, it's just all over it's just yeah in some countries like norway it, it's hit that tipping point and it's just 2025 they'll be gone whereas in australia we're still at that really bottom little turning point and then we're going to once we get up to there france and germany are hitting four seven percent they're starting to hit some of those tipping points as well now sweden's 33 percent mm. yeah it's funny how having policy helps <laughs> on that note <laughs> do you want to add anything else craig yeah uh, no it's thank you so much as i said uh you know you guys are the source of great expertise, so get it out there and, you know, keep uh, pushing to that tipping point. And, you know, also, as I said, keep, keep that conversation going with the, you know, councils and governments and all that kind of stuff, because it is important to push for that kind of, the infrastructure needs to lead a little bit as well. So, yeah, good luck. We all, uh, <laughs> we, need, we need pushing on so many different levels for this particular battle. Thanks, And Craig. thank you for your hard work too. Cheers, guys. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you for all you do. It's great. Thanks, guys. Yeah, Cheers. Enjoy the rest of the night. Thanks a lot. And the next question is from Peter. Uh, disinformation abounds when it comes to public policy concerning fossil fuel power sources. How far should science communication go to identify misinformation and question those that propagate it? Uh, I can remember when I was at school, we were given a whole lot of education about advertising and how they try to sway us with all sorts of hype and, and uh, doctored information. I think it's probably the same sort of thing. There should be that sort of education in schools. It's just you need to be able to take, apply the scientific method, research the information and winnow out the wheat from the chaff. And it's, I don't know why people are doing, I thought that was still done in schools, but maybe not. Why are people so gullible now? That'd be an interesting question to the audience. What, why do they, how do they find people becoming so gullible? Where is that science education, that, that basic, you know, look at the evidence, assess the facts. Don't just be swayed by someone telling you they think that's the case. What's, what's happened to the system that it's, is it all our social media that, that that's swamping people's thinking? I don't know. And I can't answer that question, but Richard might be able to. Yeah, I don't think I've got much to add on that one. Um, but I would come back to the question that was asked earlier about renewables policy and what we need. Um, it occurred to me 
since then that the existing renewable energy target, um, the target stopped rising in 2020 and we, we, we um, met that target. Um, but the, uh, the policy stays in place for 2030 um, and but the target doesn't keep rising. So I think a really positive thing for certainty in the industry would be to extend that renewable energy target out beyond 2030 so that STCs remain in place and, and have an increasing target to, so that those STCs uh, and LGCs have real value going forward. How are you finding it when you're going out talking to people, doing your energy assessments? Are they still very keen and very, but very dependent on those subsidies or government action? Yeah, I think they're fundamental to the price point that people are used to. Um, and, uh, but it's more for commercial projects that I think supporting uh, is, uh, the maintenance of STCs and LGCs is going to be important because um, I think f for residential, even at a low STC price, that uh, it may it will make it will continue to make sense for homes to ha to have solar. But uh, yeah, a good STC price is going to help underpin the the business case for for the wind farms and the solar farms that we still need to keep building. Yeah. The next question is from Herbert. Does panel see any future for offsetting and planting trees? For offsets and planting trees? Offsets, e.g. planting trees. Yeah, there's always gonna be a, a continuing role for offsets, um, but it's a second order thing, so I guess, we need to reduce our consumption as much as we can and then offset what we can't. So that, that's always been the place for offsets. Um, and yeah, it, it'll, it'll still remain important for the, because we, we won't be able to reduce our consumption down to zero. And it would be very good for the environment and, and, and the plants and animals of this planet do have a bit more space for them and a bit less space for us. So planting trees and, and generally restoring the environment is a good, good thing, whatever it has for the carbon as well. It's just a bonus in some ways. Yep. And from Donny, why aren't councils moving to make solar and battery storage a requirement like water storage? Um. I think the economics have got a little way to go before that's necessary. Um, that if, you are, if you've got a dollar of possible subsidy from a council or other government body, is it best directed towards subsidising energy storage or is it best directed towards subsidising heat pumps or uh, thermal envelope improvements? I'd say one of the latter two, not, not energy storage in the first instance. So yeah, we've got a lot of potential to to benefit from subsidisation of energy efficiency retrofits and uh, improved um, support for heat pumps. You'll leave it at that, Bryce. Ah, sorry, I was busy typing a um, an answer in the Q and A, so I <laughs> sort of I missed the start of it. So I was, I was trying to pick up where Richard was going, but I still didn't remember the question. That's all right, we'll go on to another one. Um, in Asia, they convert many small motorbikes into electric. Uh, how's that going here? Uh, nobody's doing that here, as far as I know. And is there a potential for it or? Uh, for when it comes to uh, push bikes. Uh, that's... Electric motorbike, yeah, electric motorbikes, I think. They're... I say when it comes to push bikes, there's definitely a very big market in converting push bikes to electric. Uh, as for motorbikes, at the moment, no. Um, part of it's to do with some of our scooter regulations and that um, 
you can't have sort of a low powered scooter without having a proper license of the thing. So in some states, so there's sort of issues there if they're low, very low power motorcycles, just like scooter type things. So it could be a regulatory issue here. Part of that will be discussed at the EV conference, by the way, on the 27th of November, that that issue of scooters and what is or isn't legal and why will be brought up and discussed. Good, and Gail is asking, I'm interested in know, knowing more about the pitch for EVs to local government. I'm in Queensland, in case that's a factor. Any support to make the argument to my local council will be appreciated. Uh, the written material or speaker who is across the technical questions. Uh, Queensland EV branch, AEVA branch, will help you out with heaps there. Uh, Graham Maniette, who's, got, who's a former chair of that branch and is still the vice chair there, will we'll be very happy to talk to you. So you get onto the AEVA branch up there, they'll be well, more than willing to help you. Good. And John Bailey asks, what's the future of EVs for the next five years? Uh, in the world, they'll be rapidly taking over. You look at Norway, well, 2025, there will only be EVs sold in Norway and in some number of other countries. By 2030, some other countries will only have 100%. So it's the transport, EV transport revolution is well underway and it, it will be an electrified transport system. By 2050, every, all transport will be electric and we'll be wondering why we put up with these fossil fuel cars. That'll be like the horse, we'll be looking back at them like horse and carts now. And does that also apply to things like, and should Australia be making things like buses and like commercial vehicles? And Damn good question. We used to support an electric or a car industry. Yes. Um. <laughs> I, I was just leaving that one hanging because it's, it's a policy issue that seems to be all bound up with all the other policy issues that our government seems intent on ignoring. Are the economics easier, though, for commercial vehicles? Like there's not uh, quite as many manufacturers. And yeah, all SEA trucks are doing quite well, and they've got some contracts in America now, so there's certainly a good startup here that is actually doing well in it. So there's certainly potential, and the Victorian government has put a significant amount of money in to support them, so there is at least some support from government levels. Same for ACE vehicles who are doing the small carbon fiber chassis uh, like commercial vehicles uh, the small van and the small ute they've got some seed funding from I think the queensland government or arena somebody recently and there's some more i think one and the queensland government's about to put some more in i think something like that two lots of five million so they should be building in south australia within a year they have got a prototype built at the moment i would have thought actually that's an easier one to justify mm. uh, commercial vehicles than domestic because of the yep. distances traveled and generally they're not going a long way from home. Yeah, so you like commercial them. vehicles, well, are all like delivery vans running around towns. They're perfect for electrification. So why hasn't that happened? Bloody good question. In Europe, they are, and there's uh, quite a number of them for sale. In different manufacturers are building them. They're, the only one brought here is the Kangoo ZE EV. However, that's changing. Late this year, there will be a Chinese vehicle being imported by a new automotive company, and it was a, it's a two-ton van. It'll be available here late this year, I believe. Again, there will actually be a presentation on that at the... I keep harping on about the conference, sorry. Just there's so many speakers there, I keep going, oh, there's more on that. If you want to hear more about it, come to the uh, 2020 conference. And buses? That would seem another obvious one to do very hmm. early on because they do a lot of kilometres. But Yeah, there's been a lot of experimentation in them and for some reason they haven't kicked off. Whereas in China, I mean, the, the Shenzhen or whatever it is, hmm. uh, has 10, their whole fleet of 10,000 buses is all electric now. And they've just they thought that's just such a no-brainer. Why, why you know, They've just done it. Whereas here they're still trialling them. And there have been a number of companies trying to build them and I don't quite know why that really hasn't taken off yet. Fingers crossed, um, one of those companies will take off soon, but there are there are people here trying. And a question from Tim, this is a loaded question, Tim. Why don't heat pumps get no respect? So Richard, you can answer. <laughs> I love heat pumps. That's a good question, Tim. Um, partly education, partly 
um, policy. Um, yeah, let's see. Heat pumps get more love from from government policy, <laughs> and that might come in. Uh, heck, we we get um, subsidies for solar hot water and for 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 solar PV panels. solar panels. Um, and in a very real and tangible sense, heat pumps are harvesting renewable energy. So um, you should get a discount or a subsidy on your air conditioner for the same reason. Uh, in Victoria, I think we do that. There's some subsidies out at the moment. In fact, the subsidies are so good that my son-in-law got two hot water heat pumps for no dollars. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm talking about... Um, I'm not talking about hot water, I'm talking about uh, space heating uh, where it um, doesn't apply. But it, it seems to be fairly positive turn on on the hot water side. That seems to be. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, from Anna, what do people think about Labor's plan to fix the grid? What is their plan? You don't have to say that. Um, I thought they were spending a lot of money on uh, connecting up, particularly Victoria and Northwest, and putting in connections to South Australia, to New South Wales, New South Wales to Victoria, and Victoria to Tasmania. I thought that was part of their grid plan. Yeah, upgraded transmission is. Um, more uh, under the auspices of IEMO and AEMC and uh, so it's sort of yeah there's only so much the state government can do there um, but yeah uh, improving transmission is, is key because there's a lot of renewable projects which are held up for want of um, better transmission And from Lee, would Richard's rental policy including include requiring rental houses to be uplifted to five-star homes to plug those holes in his bucket? Um, that would be good, but I think to get specific about how that could work, it would be sufficient to just put in place a policy that it's been agreed in principle at COAG more than 10 years ago, and that is uh, what's called mandatory disclosure. So mandatory disclosure is the idea that anyone who buys or rents a property should have full access to information disclosing how the house performs with regard to energy. So COAG signed off on this in principle and it's been applied for commercial property across Australia uh, for a few years now um, and it, the the, um, the sky hasn't fallen in um, so if you if you're renting a significant office space in Australia then your the vendor or landlord is required to disclose the energy performance and in exactly the same way, someone buying or renting a house should be able to expect full disclosure of how much that house is going to cost in relative terms to, to heat and cool. Now, the only jurisdiction that's actually done that uh, in Australia is the ACT. And even then, not fully. Um, but yeah, the ACT is, is, is the standout in terms of making that that happens. So yeah, mandatory disclosure of energy performance is, is the way to go. And a similar thing, I suppose, on EVs, isn't it? Uh, which we do have some energy or vehicles in general, energy performance figures. Uh, yeah, it's, it depends. Most uh, EVs are around sort of the 14, 13 to 15 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometer range of energy. 
Jaguar being a luxury car, sort of in the range of, we don't care about the amount of petrol we use. And they you know, transferred that same concept when they built electric cars. So they're about 20 kilowatt hours per hundred kilometers. Um, so yeah, but most EVs seem to be quite efficient. So, and the latest move with Tesla, moving the Model 3 to have the heat pump out of the Model Y, they're getting 11.9, I think, kilowatt hours per hundred kilometers. So they, they've moved back into the most efficient around. I know my Kona around towns lurks around 12, 12 and a half mm. very nicely. Mm. And what are you driving, Richard? I drive a Holden Volt um, and it's eight, yeah, eight years old now. So it was a, an excellent car. It's a plug-in hybrid. Uh, I'd love a pure EV, but uh, yeah, the, the Volt's a great sort of transitional vehicle. Um, all electric around town and a mixture of battery and petrol on the open road. So it's rechargeable. Yeah. So all electric range of about 50 to 60 kilometers and petrol range of about over 400. Yeah, I've been answering a few questions on the written in the Q&A about the lifespan of batteries and things. The Holden Volts have been hanging in, lasting extremely well. They've still got pretty much the same range that they had when they were new eight years ago. So they had a lot of headroom above the quoted battery capacity. So obviously they've been a well-designed EV and, and are still lasting going the distance. So after eight years, those batteries are nowhere near needing replacing. For my Leaf that I sold, it was 2011 Leaf, and I sold it earlier this year. So it's about nine years old then. It still had about 90 to 100 kilometre range left in it. And the new owner is only using it for just beetling back and forth to the shops and what have you. Very short trip. So it'll go for at least another two or three years. So its battery will be 10 to 12 years old before it needs replacing. And then it's still good for a standing storage for another eight, 10 years before it needs recycling. So there's an awful lot of life in a battery. And it, you know, it's not going to it's a lot of efficiency in its lifespan. So you might have up to 20 years before it actually finally gets deconstructed and recycled. Yeah, the other point about EV batteries is they fail, they don't have a sudden failure. Like the, the end of life of the battery is very a soft limit. Um, it, it's a point that really depends on your expectations. Uh, if you're happy with slightly reduced range and, and available power, then uh, you, know, you might get 20 years out of it. Um, so mm. yeah, they just sort of fade away a bit, but mm. it can take a long time. Yeah, the, the lithium cell is a, a remarkably robust cell when you're looking at it, really. You just don't, don't over, over discharge it. They really, really don't like that. Yeah. And Richard, you've, uh, you're buying a house in Cape Patterson area? Yeah, building a passive house, yes. So it's a passive house. So how's that going? And what's, can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. Um, uh, we're building at a new development called The Cape, which many people may be aware of. Um, so we brought into the second stage of that estate um, and boy it's been over three years uh, since we first in fact it was a <laughs> it was an ATA event uh, a visit no it wasn't it was a BZE visit down to the Cape in uh, 2017 um, where we first got involved and since then it's been a great journey so the house is nearly finished and with any luck we'll be in for Christmas. Mm. Very good and how what rating is it is it sort of 10 stars? On the Natter scale it's come in at 8.3 um, but I think that actually understates its performance um, that was quite conservatively rated um, and it's um, hope we're intending to get it um, passive house certified. It had the first blower door test about a month ago, uh, uh, which came in at 0.52 air changes per hour. So that's under the 0.6 that we need to get to. Very good. And has it cost a lot more to, to get to that standard of construction? Or the 
performance? Yeah. <laughs> it's a hard question to answer because it was sort of built with that in mind from the start. But um, and and then there's also the question of if you weren't go going certified, you know, we might we'd probably be doing some of these things anyway, like um, yeah. along the lines of passive house. So. It, it, it's a harder question to answer than you might think, so I'll, I'll uh, pass on that one. But overall, the cost isn't um, substantially higher to go to eight star than six stars. No, no. Yeah, a well-designed house um, can can be very good value. Um, yeah. And then the Cape. I think all the houses are they eight star plus. Minimum seven and a half uh, is the is the requirement, and the average has been over eight. Uh, not many have. Yeah, it's been interesting um, that not many people have sort of pushed pushed their luck in terms of only just getting seven and a half. Most people have well exceeded the minimum requirement. So yeah, it's been, it's been a good experience, um, and the house is going to be uh, it's turned out turning out better than I would have thought in terms of how it looks and how we think it's going to going to be like to be in and um, yeah. Have a look at my 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 um, blog is newenergythinking.com/blog, and I've been blogging about it there. If anyone's interested. Okay, we might have you on a renew session like this on the track too. Sure, love to. Um, are we going to wrap it up soon? Yeah, are you done? How are you back, Bryce? Are you just about done for um, I was busy typing some answers. There was a one on um, a vehicle to X, oh yeah, vehicle to grid, vehicle to home. It was a couple of questions I was just typing up answers yeah. for if people so wanted to read them. It's all vehicle yep. to grid. It's an interesting one. Yeah, so yeah, I, I wrote an article in Renew 153, so the last one or before, uh, Richard may disagree with me, but I think um, vehicle to home or vehicle to grid for domestic purposes is probably not going to catch on in the long run because the times you want your battery to do your backup, you're probably away from home somewhere. The times you want your car to be soaking up solar is also when you're away at home from at home from work, away from home at work or away from the weekend if you if the grid happens to go down and the uh, fridge melts, whereas a basic um, home storage system will be there 24 seven for you to do what you want. You're never going to want to plug in your car every time you come home and leave. So yeah, maybe four, four six, eight times a day versus I charge my car once every week or two, which is one of the convenience factors of owning an EV. No petrol stations, no charging in, uh, it's just to charge it up on the other occasion when I need it. So vehicle to grid system is also very expensive at the moment. You're looking at if you could put one in, because they're not licensed to install in Australia at the moment, about 15 grand for changing your home electrics in the box. Whereas you're looking at what, four to 12 for a battery system. And as we've been saying earlier, that those battery systems will come down in price when the EV batteries start getting recycled. So they're not new cells going into them. They'll be the second life. So we call a battery system, but home will be a second life for the car battery. So my gut feeling is that a home battery system will be a preferable system to the vehicle to grid system. Also, at the moment, you can't install vehicle to grid systems. They're not licensed for installation in Australia. They're purely for a uh, test systems. I think it's about 50 being done in ACT, for instance, as trial systems. There might be some Chatamo stuff coming available early next year, but only Nissan to Chatamo now, and they're giving it up anyway with the Araya, the next model and CCS won't have it until about 23 or 20, so 24, 25. So even if you want vehicle to grid, you will be able to, but it'd be mid 2020s before you'll be able to buy it. And I suspect the hype might've been passed by then and people go, for home use, it may not be a lot of value. For commercial fleet use, I think they'll love it. But that's a whole other story, a whole other thing to unpack. Okay, you don't want to buy in on that, Richard? No, well, that, that question, at the heart of that question is, again, that the thought about ways on getting batteries for homes. And I think that one of the, well, there are a couple of keys to making that happen. One is obviously sales coming down in price. 
But the other is um, virtual power plants. There's, there's a number of different vendors out there that'll let your new home battery system be part of a fleet of batteries that, that give benefit to the grid, not just to the house. So I, I think the key to making home battery systems work is connecting them up to a virtual power plant. To, it, it opens up different value streams. It makes the value, the batteries more valuable to yourself and to the grid. And um, yeah, uh, yeah, all around it yeah, is a good thing to, to be making them serve not just yourself, but to improve the operation of the grid. Yeah, for sure. And that's where I was coming from with fleets, because they'll be able to be able to have a virtual power plant with their you know, 10 or 20% of their cars will be plugged in at any one time, and they can join in that virtual power plant to support and stabilise the grid. But homes, there won't be enough of them, and they'll be too irregularly plugged in to be a much value there. Yeah, that's for car stuff, and the battery side is, is a, another, a whole other battery thing that'll be coming in as the years go by. Yeah, yeah. The, the players to watch in the VPP space. There's Reposit Power from Canberra, who look, they've been around for a few years now, and, and I like their work. Uh, there's um, Mondo and their UB system, UBI, and there's also a company called Switched In, um, which are doing some interesting stuff in this space. Good. Well, we'll start to. Uh, tidy things up. Um, for EVs, if people are wanting more information, um, I'll plug my own Nillenbeck Shire uh, EV session, which is on the price talking for a couple of hours next Thursday night. So I think the link will, will be put in the chat. And, it, and uh, Bryce showed the link on one of his slides beforehand. And I also can... his uh, conference, which is huge. Um, we have lots of great international speakers, so if you're into EVs, certainly worth looking at that one. I'll just quickly throw that one. There's your Nillimbic one, if people want the um, the link for that. Uh, cleanenginillimbic.org.au events, and you've got, um, if I can flick to the end, there we go for the EV Vision Conference. It's uh, ava.delegateconnect.co, and you can get all the details from there. Good. Now I'm just going to find a button to stop sharing. Sorry about that. Here we go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, we're going to put up a brief poll shortly. Um, I appreciate if you could complete it and then hit the leave events button. Um, but I thought tonight was a really great evening. Uh, lots of good analysis and some great questions. Mm. Um, so now we just have to go and uh, do something about it. Yep. So thank you. Craig in absence and Richard and Bryce, it was really good. Um, and you'll have to listen to 280 people or so who attended clapping in silence.